Shalom. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. I hope you enjoy the webcast. I do want to let you know that there are some massive thunderstorms in the area. This happens a lot here in Florida in the summertime. So if you hear any loud thunder crashes, that is not the voice of the Lord uh, as it was at Sinai. But uh, I just want to make sure that you know in case we might have some uh, internet uh, connection issues or anything. I hope not. So anyway, um, tonight's class, The Word Became Flesh, or actually I titled it When the Word Becomes Flesh, because although the scripture says in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, uh, when the Word becomes flesh, is really the teaching of that scripture, and, and I put it in present tense, where it becomes something that means something to you, not just something that happened historically 2,000 years ago, but something that happened to you. And I'd like to begin tonight in the early, early portions of the Torah in Genesis 2, verse 7. You know, it talks about the first humans. The first humans uh, were known as Adam and Chava, or Adam and Eve, and they actually, they were not born, you know, they were, uh, they were created, and that's something that is different about them than the rest of us. I mean, I don't know about you, but I was born from the womb of a woman, <laughs> and that's a uh, one of the, the watermarks of every human being that were born of another human being, particularly a woman. Yeshua, the Messiah himself, was born of a woman. And that's one of the, of the things that tells us that he was, he was a man, but he was also the son of God. He was as much God as he was man. He was fully God and fully man. A bit of a mystery, but in any case, uh, that's who he was. Now, uh, mankind was created from the dust of the earth. Adam was created from the dust of the earth. And then Chava was uh, created from his selah or his rib. Uh, what the heck was that? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Maybe it was his DNA. But uh, it uh, selah, interestingly, is is a feminine form of the word cell, which means image or shadow. So even as Adam was created in the image of God, so uh, Chava was created in the image of her husband, which was the image of God. And one of the uh, important things that the Torah tells us about all this, it comes from Genesis 2, 7. It says Adonai Elohim formed the man out of the dust of the ground. Again, Adam was not born. He was formed from the dust of the ground. That is key because, you know, uh, we are animate creatures. And humanity has this thing in common that Adam had. There was something, even though he was not born, but he was formed from dust. There was something about him that was animate, not only animate, but there was a life in him. And that's the, the key part of this verse. In the second part of it, it says that Adonai Elohim formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. So what is this, uh, this breath of life business that really is the life of man, you see, because otherwise he was just no different than dust, you know, like a, a clay statue that you might make uh, in the mud or at the beach or something. But it's the, the breath of life, which is in the Torah is nishmat chayim, nishmat chayim. Chayim means life. Nishmat, which is from the root nishama is often the, the neshama is talked about a lot uh, in, in the, uh, it's mentioned in the scriptures, it's talked about a lot in 
in Hasidic circles, if you're familiar with that music at all, you, you know, you hear a lot of references to it. Um, it's, neshama is usually translated as the soul. The neshmat chayim, the breath of life, the soul of life. Uh, this is the human soul, you see. This is what made humanity a life. And, you know, where does this, what is this thing? What, what is this nishmat chaim? What is it? Where does it come from? This is really the origin. This is the really the image in which we're created. This is this is the the, the immortality, the eternality, the image of God, and all of that, which is found in man. Now, um, I want you, if you would. If you could just, you know, think for a moment and just just forget forget the physical body for a moment. I know that's kind of hard to do, especially every time you look in the mirror. But um, the thing is that, um, you know, we have a tendency to identify with the physical body. And so um, we look at one another and we see what we see. And we judge by appearances. But that the, the point is that that is not really who we are. When you look in the mirror, when you look at one another, what we see is not really who we are. But who we really are is that is that life that was put in us from the beginning. And that life was not created, you see. The reason that mankind was immortal and 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 I should add the reason that we are immortal, because we are, even though we die, we all stand before God for judgment one way or another. There is an eternal soul, like it or not. <laughs> some, some folks would prefer that there wasn't one. But uh, like it or not, there is one. And, um, and we are immortal beings. But there, there, is a, there is a change that has happened uh, since the Garden of Eden, in, in which there really was no experience of death. Now, we as humans experienced death, except there was one among us who experienced death but overcame death. Death had no power over him. He demonstrated that. This is how he proved who he was by rising from the dead. And he taught us that if we would come to him and learn of him and sit at his feet and be in communion with him constantly that we would become like unto him that we would become children of god like unto the messiah messianic that's what it means you know like the messiah uh that's supposedly what christian means too like the christ it's the same idea just different language and so uh he, that he would give unto us also eternal life eat my flesh drink my blood then you will have eternal life this is the bread of life that came down from heaven the man who eats of this bread shall live forever this is what he taught us okay now modern religion has reduced that to this formula where you're supposed to make a decision it's called decision theology and it's that really is just that is a good thing i'm not knocking it but that really is just the starting game but it's it's the whole thing has been reduced to this formula of decision decision theology where you're supposed to make a decision and then based on that decision you just get everything and it, and really doesn't matter what else you do because you've done everything you're supposed to do which is make a decision make a profession maybe a couple of sacraments like uh you know, be immersed into the water and join up somewhere. And all of that stuff is good, but that was never the whole ball of wax. You see, that was never Messiah's teaching. And so uh, it's in the modern, uh, particularly in the Christian world, but in the modern uh, religious mind uh, in the West, you know, the idea is just to, to belong somewhere, join somewhere. And you're, you're constantly told you're okay, you're okay, because you've made a decision and you've joined up. And so, you know, somebody's getting bigger and somebody's getting uh, more powerful and based on these kinds of, of teachings, you see. But what the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, taught 
is that we should be joined unto him. We should be molded unto him, connected to the vine, that we should um, be in constant contact, communion, communion with him. That's the, the key to the whole relationship. That's the key to the restoration of this neshama that we have lost sight of as a race. This is what happened to us. Is as a race, we fell into ignorance and blindness concerning who we are and what we are. We lost sight of the immortal life in which we were created, and we have uh, um, taken on a false understanding of the world around us that we see as we see it through a a, a lens uh, that deceives us. Now. Um, before I go too far with that, because I teach on that in a lot of these classes, um, let me get back on track here to Genesis 2. And I was talking about how um, uh, the man and the woman, they were not born, they were created. And so um, this life was put in them. And when Chava or Eve was created, you know, Adam was like, hey, that's pretty cool. So the Lord brought her to Adam, and this is what he said. This one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman or Isha. See, man is Ish, woman is Isha. For from man was this one taken. From man was she taken. Now listen to this part. I really want to kind of focus on this now. This verse here, Genesis 2, 24 from the Torah. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. Again, for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh you notice it says one flesh one flesh there okay not uh, one spirit uh but one flesh and so but even though it says one flesh it isn't flesh like this you know it isn't as i was saying what the body you look at that's not really who you are and now we have a natural tendency to try to identify with that because it's what we see but but that's that's not really who you are and the body perishes you know one day this this pile of protoplasm is just going to be gone and then what there's something else you see there's something eternal about me and about you and so forth so um the two shall be one flesh what does this mean uh now you know i mean there is there is a mystery going on there i mean how can two separate individuals be one to begin with and this thing which both of them are which is designated as basar echad basar means flesh echad means one the two shall be one flesh we know it's not a body like the body you're looking at on the screen right now because two bodies can't be one and and i know i know that sometimes people think that that refers to sex but it doesn't. Now, there is a mystery there, and the mystery is revealed through sexual union between a man and woman in marriage, of course. And so, um, you know, God has blessed sex in marriage, and sex is holy in marriage, and that's one of the great purposes. It's really the higher purpose of sex in marriage um, is it's, it's not the coming together of the bodies in the physical sense, but it's the revelation of the unity of the man and woman that is realized, but not just through sex, but through, but through their marital relationship. A man leaves his mother and father and is joined. It's that joinder, not necessarily physical joinder, although that it can be, you know, part of the deal. Hopefully it is, you know, it's important for a man and woman to have that. Uh, but but uh, but more important, there's a there's a higher thing revealed there 
that there is this um, this mystery and this revelation that comes in marriage in which the man and woman realize that they're that they're one one flesh but note you know see this is one of many places in the Bible where the term flesh is used to refer to a kind of body but it's not the body it's not the physical body that you're looking at on the screen or that you're looking at if you look down at your hands you know that's your physical body unless you're looking in a mirror you know look at your body that is not who you are but there there is this life you see the word became flesh and dwelt among us there is this life out there that's always been there that is embedded in the cosmos and it is the son of god the father the son and the spirit are one god not three but one and it's difficult for us to try to comprehend this but you know we use these terminologies to try to give ourselves uh, an understanding but you have god who is transcendent who created the universe but he he's also imminent he's embedded in the universe which he created he's also omnipresent and the omnipresence of god is is typically what we uh, refer to as the ruach hakodesh or holy spirit um and there is this body this neshama this eternal soul call it what you will there is an eternal life and that life is the light of men and that life is the life in which mankind was created and that and even though we're not aware of it to the extent that we once were the eternal life which we are is, is still there okay so rather than reduce uh this whole journey of being a yeshua follower to some formula of decision making and and you know right beliefs and ideology rather than do that what we should be doing and we see this in the lord's teachings what we should be doing is becoming more and more conformed to this life which is the life that was put in us to uh, from the beginning and so in marriage there's this realization that this is and see this is what happens in a marriage is that you it, you know at least it, it should happen uh that you realize that you're more than just this person that you're you're really you know because you're you're collaborating you're co-laboring with this one person who you become so intimate with over so many years you realize that you're not who you think you are in the natural that there is something beyond that and that both you and her are or, or you and him are if you're a girl then your spouse is a him <clears throat> and so um now, now marriage is not the only way that this is revealed. Now, I know there's a lot of people watching this webcast, and if you're single, this is not in any way to uh, cause you to feel left out. Uh, you do not have to be married to realize what I'm speaking to tonight. It's just that, you know, marriage is, is given to us for that purpose. Otherwise, you know, we'd be like the animals. We'd just be flitting around from one mate to the next, and and uh, there's there'd be a lot of problems with that. Uh, not just that we would miss out on the revelation of this mystery, but moreover that um, humanity would become like animals, and we would never be civilized. We would never build a just society. But that's not my uh, my topic tonight. So. Uh, bone of my bones flesh of my flesh the two shall be one flesh but again it doesn't that's one example where it doesn't necessarily 
when the Bible uses the word flesh, necessarily refer to the physical body. You see, there are other times it does, you know, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, that kind of thing. But, but here we see that it's used in a different sense. Now, Shaul in the New Testament, he really expounds on this. And I'm going to flip to Ephesians 4 in my Tree of Life Version Bible. Ephesians 4, verse 22. He, what Rav Shul or Paul does is he, you know, he's a Torah teacher. This guy is trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He's the rabbi of rabbis. And most of his teachings in the New Testament are what you call a drash, which is a um, expounding on things that are taught in the Torah, you see. And so this is one of the, the those in Ephesians where he does that. And it's kind of, um, there's kind of a, there's different topics that he addresses in the book of Ephesians, but this thing is kind of a thread that runs through the whole thing. Just for example, in Ephesians 2, he talks about something called uh, Adam Echad Chadash, which is the one new man, one new man. And I know that uh, a lot of folks take that to mean like he's talking about Jew and Gentile becoming one, and and that is part of it. But that's that's not really his main point there, um, and and that is something that happens in the one new man. But what he's really saying in the one new man is that is that through Yeshua, the Messiah, there's a new humanity that's rising up. Just like Adam was a whole new race of beings, Yeshua, who came from man, but he was the son of God as well, he has become the, the king and the progenitor of a whole new race. And it's, is it a human race? Yes, but it's not... Adam anymore. It's Yeshua. Some might say the second Adam, but it's a new Adam. You see, Adam, uh, Adam Echad Chadash, Adam Echad Chadash, a new Adam, a new humanity. And so, and so in this new man, you, as a member of this new man, become hopefully uh, restored to God and conformed to the image of God into the image of this life in which we were created, this immortal life, which is always there from the beginning, from before the beginning and hasn't gone anywhere, is still there, you see? So, you know, we were born, but that life is still in us. And so our, our, um, focus in our spiritual lives should be to become more and more conformed to the life, the eternal life in which, uh, in which image we're created, which is the reality of our being, the body, the flesh, not this kind of flesh, but the body. Let me elaborate a little further using the words of Shaul. He, in Ephesians 4, starts talking about this thing called the new self, okay? Now, now some of these uh, translations say the new man, the old man and the new man. I, either way, it's all, it's all good. Um, Ephesians 4.22, he says, With respect to your former lifestyle, you are to lay aside the old self, corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What the heck is that? The spirit of your mind? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So there's some spirit that he calls the spirit of your mind that we're supposed to be renewed in. What does he talk about? He's talking about the Nishmat Chaim. He's talking about the eternal soul, which was, is, and is to come, and in, in, in which each and every true Yeshua follower that's born, that's reborn, born again, part of the new humanity is, at least in theory, uh, 
supposed to be reconnected with, renewed with. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Get back, Jojo. <laughs> if I may quote the Beatles, get back to where you once belonged. You know, I don't know that that's what they were singing about, but that just came to mind. So that's where that's what we come. That's what we come from. We come from this very thing that he's talking about. You know, you see, because there's only one God. There's only one eternal life out there. There, there. there can't be billions and billions of gods. Anything in this universe that is eternal is, is, um, is part of God. And this is what it means when it says everything that was made was made through him and there's nothing that was made except that which was made through him. Eternality, infinity, immortality, this kind of thing, it all comes from God. So as long as we stay connected to our maker, our redeemer, our king, our father, as long as we stay connected, then uh, we stay in the uh, in the call in the original calling of mankind, which is to be immortal beings, children of God. That's a better way of putting it. But we've lost that connection as a race. That's that's what's happened to us. And God so loved the world, He sent His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And and yet, how are we to maintain communion with a figure that lived 2,000 years ago and is now up in heaven somewhere? How, how are we supposed to do that? Just by reading about him? Talking about him? It's really not enough, you see? That's why he said before he left, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. He wants us to know that the he who he really is is not going anywhere. Because the he who he really is was always here, even before him. That's why he said before Abraham was, I am. That's why he said in the book of Revelation when he started talking to his disciple, Yochanan, I'm the Aleph and the Tub, or Alpha and Omega, if you prefer. I'm the beginning and the end. Who was, is, is to come. He was, is, always will be. Uh, you know, if 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 it's if our only hope is in a figure that lived two thousand years ago, even though he rose from the dead, even though he ascended up into heaven, I don't know about you, but have you met him personally in a body like this? I haven't. Nobody has. And yet, I can still testify in complete truth that I have met him and that I meet him daily. I meet with him every day, most days, several times a day. That is the key to being a Messiah follower is maintaining communion with him meetings regular meetings but how do you meet with a figure that lived historically 2000 years ago and isn't here now that's the crux of the whole matter and so the word became flesh and dwelt among us or tabernacled among us is normally interpreted to mean a reference to uh Yeshua's birth, the Messianic birth, the, the birth of the Messiah. And it's more than that. And, and if you follow his teachings and learn his teachings, he wanted us to understand it as more than that. You see, he was the fullness of that word. But every time you make contact 
with God, this living presence that abides in the midst of us, which is the very soul of our being. Every time you make contact, this is what it means. The word became flesh, not, not this kind of flesh. But you made contact, okay? And when you make contact, I'm going to tell you what happens as a natural, inevitable result. It may take a day, a week, or a month, or I don't know how long, but it inevitably will happen that when you make contact with the Spirit of God, that fruit is born of it. Fruit is born of it, and I mean the kind that you see with your eyes and hold in your hands. Whether it's health, whether it's relationships, whether it's uh, joy, a lot of people are suffering from depression, whether it's finances, provision, the earth is the Lord and all the fullness thereof. It's all his. All that the Father has is mine, said Yeshua. The New Testament says, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. Everything of value in the universe belongs to God. And our calling is to, to make contact, to have kesher. Kesher is Hebrew for contact. Some people get really upset with me when I tell them, you don't even have to ask. You don't have to ask God for the stuff that you need because he already knows. What he wants is your heart. He's inviting you into the secret place, into an intimate relationship. He loves you. He knows what your needs are. He doesn't want you to stand there and ask him for things. He wants you to just be satisfied to be with him in spirit and in truth, because there is a body. And it's not a body like this, but it's the kind of body that was breathed into Adam when he was created. This is the body through which the whole universe was created. This is the body which Yeshua was. And therefore a voice testified when he went into the mikvah and came out. Zebini Yedidi, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. And every time you connect with the Messiah that he is, that voice bears witness because you've made that connection. You're a child of God. The Spirit of the Lord testifies, Romans 8. The Spirit of the Lord bears witness that we are children of God. It doesn't do you any good to declare that you're a children of God. To say it, to proclaim it, doesn't mean anything. It's the Spirit of the Lord that bears witness. And that's just a question of degree. You know, to what extent? In the case of Yeshua, he was the fullness of that. He was he was God as a man, but he's invited us into sonship and daughtership. And it's through this mystery that Paul speaks about um, and uh, that the New Testament speaks about in general, the word becomes flesh. So Paul goes on here in Ephesians 5. You know, first he's just talking about be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. This is from Ephesians 4.24. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay? So there's a new self like God. And that's who we're supposed to be. Now, he, he also um, goes on here and he says... In Ephesians 5, 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, see, now he's going back to that 
scripture from Genesis, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Love your wife as you love yourself. Now he gets more specific. Verse 29, Ephesians 5. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Messiah does his community because we are members of his body. You see, Messiah has a body, not the body with which Yeshua walked the earth. The body that was crucified and rose from the dead and now is, is up in heaven. Um, that was a body that looked, he had hands that looked like this. That was a body that looked like this. But he was infinitely more than that. That's why he said, I'm with you always. And it's in saying, because we are members of his body, we are members of that eternal life, that eternal presence. Not the whole thing, but members of it. And as members, members of the family tree of God, if we are, then we are children of God. And this is what it means to be messianic. For this reason, verse 31, now he quotes the Torah, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am talking about Messiah and his community. So just like a man and his wife are one flesh, and it's a mystery because how could two bodies be one flesh? You know, I know. If I have a mosquito on my arm and I smack it, my wife doesn't feel it. <laughs> you know, if my leg itches and I scratch it, my wife doesn't feel me scratching my leg. If her nose is a little stuffy and I blow my nose, it doesn't do anything to her. She just keeps watching TV. And yet, even though we're separate physical bodies, we are one body through this mystery that Paul's talking about here. And the analogy that he's making is that it's the mystery is great, but I'm talking about the Messiah and his community. The, the, mess, the Messiah, the messianic body, is the body into which his whole community belongs. There is a body, an eternal body, an eternal life, a new self. That's what it means to be born again, is to be part of that. That's what it means to connect with the body. The word became flesh. When you connect with that body, the word becomes flesh because there's cash share. There's a connection. And in the connection, the things that are needed get released, whatever it may be. The uh, the one other scripture I wanted to mention tonight, I know I'm short on time now because I don't want to go too late. But this one is from 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. 12, 4. You know, uh, I want you to consider something when when the Wright brothers invented the airplane, the law of aerodynamics was always there. It was there for centuries and centuries and centuries, but nobody knew it. It was a law. It didn't change. It didn't just show up on the scene. But these guys came along and realized it. And that's where the connection was made. They understood the law of aerodynamics. Now, I'm, I'm drawing a comparison. I'm making an analogy here. And once they made that connection with that law, the airplane, which was the physical manifestation of what they discovered, was a natural byproduct. It was inevitable. It was sure to happen. And see, this is exactly how it is when the word becomes flesh. When we connect with the almighty God, when we connect with him, when we connect with this eternal presence, 
uh, what happens is the natural result. It may not happen instantly, but it will happen that the fruit is born. It's just like the uh, the invisible vine that runs through a tree, and this is the this is the image that Yeshua gave in his teaching in John 15, where he said, "I'm the true vine. My Father is the husbandman. He taught us He's the vine. You're the branches. Abide in Him, then you'll bear fruit." <clears throat> Paul, here in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about there are various kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Okay, notice that. Not many spirits, but the same spirit. Now, this is one of the uh, most confusing things I find for some people, but it doesn't have to be. Look, God is a spirit. God is an omnipresent spirit. God is not only uh, omnipresent, but he's omnipotent and he's omniscient. There is nothing like him. There is nothing like the Lord, you know, and the, the other the other gods. The other um, entities that are called gods, whether just really, really powerful men or fallen angels. Fallen angels, which the ancients uh, recognized as gods, but the the ancient Hebrews got the revelation that there's one God and none of them are anything like God. They have influence over the world, but it's a different kind of influence. It's a different kind of, of spirit. They're not spirits in the sense that God is the spirit, the, Ru the Ruach HaKodesh. There's one God, one spirit, and anything else that is going on that has influence over this world. Well, just know this, this world is based on lies and deception. But there's one spirit that is based entirely on truth. <laughs> there's no deception going on. Not there. There are various kinds of service, but the same Lord. See, we're all different. But there's one God, one Lord one life and that in him was the life and the life was the light of men there's one life one lord one spirit we are all diverse as human beings diverse and individualized according to god's will god's grace but that that which is the same about each and every one of us is that we all belong to this one body you know, and that's what he's trying to express here. Um, I'll skip down to verse 13 for just, or excuse me, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also is Messiah. Okay? One body. So it's not like, there's this eternal soul and that eternal soul. And, you know, it's not like everybody has a different eternal soul, but there's one eternal life, one body. And there are diverse parts, diverse and individualized expressions that the Lord in his infinite grace has given unto each one of us that is a part. But one body. He goes on, again at the end of verse 12, one body, so also is Messiah. For in one spirit we were all immersed into one body, whether Jewish or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. You notice he just keeps emphasizing one body, one spirit, one immersion, one God. He talks about the different parts, the foot, the hand, and so forth, the eye. Um, many parts, verse 19, if they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, yet one body. So if you are born of the Messiah, then you're part of this messianic body, and this messianic body is one body.
body. This is the, the eternal life in which Adam was created. The eternal life which Yeshua was, come down from heaven, walked the earth as a man, died for the sins of the world, rose from the dead, and he has taught us. So we've got we've to do more than just, uh, you know, just learn and believe the historical facts about Yeshua in order to live victoriously. We've got to do more. We've got to delve into his teachings. Find out, you know, what, what is the teaching that he brought to the world? And I, I find that most of the world has been missing that. And you see it from A to Z. You see it from Genesis to Revelation. It's all there. But, uh, you know, Bible facts are great. But there's more, there's more to this calling of being a Messiah follower. He's looking for those who follow him in spirit and in truth. There is an ever-present spirit, which is the true substance, the reality of our beings. And that's the one body. That's the body which the man and woman who are joined as one realize through this uh, mystery of matrimony. That's the body that's revealed through Messiah's relationship to the congregation. That's what Paul is talking about here when he keeps talking about things like being renewed in the spirit of your mind, and one, one ruach. These are all just different names for God in the midst of us. You're all the body of Messiah and members individually. So that's all that I have time for tonight. I appreciate very much all of you being here. Uh, this, um, this webinar is, um, well, this is the last one for the month of August, isn't it? So um, that's pretty cool. But I tell you what, I'm excited because the high holidays, also called the Jewish holidays by some, are coming right up. And they're not really the Jewish holidays, but they're for everyone who feels called. And I'll be teaching on that uh, quite a bit through the month of September. I may start next week or it may be the week after uh, I haven't quite decided that yet, but I'll be announcing it soon. And I know everybody likes to learn about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and all that. So that's going to be coming up in the month of September. Rosh Hashanah this year is, is that first week of October. So um, it's, a, it's an exciting time. I appreciate you being here tonight. In order to continue to bring you these broadcasts, we appreciate your financial support. Uh, your financial support is needed, and I can tell you with complete confidence you're sowing into a precious work of the Lord. When you bless Israel, you're blessed, and this is one of the things God is doing in Messianic Judaism. This is a part of the revival of Israel. It's the very heart of it, and I encourage you. We need your help, so I encourage you to consider um, a donation. You can do that through PayPal at templenj.org. That's templenj.org. Thank you for coming tonight. Shalom. God bless you. Lila Tove.